Hello. Um, today I'm going to talk about this book, which is the diaries of Sir Ernest Mason Sato from 1906 to 1911. So this is um, edition, sorry, um, Eureka Press uh, uh, book published by Eureka Press of Kyoto. It's a very lovely volume. Uh, it was published in 2015 um, as part of a series of the collected works of Japanologists. Um, it has some color plates. Um, there we are. Uh, Ottery St. Mary, which are, these are photographs I took. And um, Ottery, Ottery St. Mary in Devon, where Sato retired, and that's his, his grave there in Ottery. And it has a forward by Professor Ian Nish, uh, which I'm going to read now. Uh, Although Sato would not admit it, it was probably with sadness that he left Peking after five and a half years. Exceptionally among British officials, Sato was both Sinophile and Japanophile. Because of the language and his longer service in Japan, he probably veered towards the latter. But he had probably seen enough of both countries by 1906. Whether he would have welcomed another appointment elsewhere at the age of 63 is open to question. He admits in his diary that if Sir Edward Gray, the foreign secretary, had offered him a return to Tokyo, he would have accepted, but no such offer was made. There was sadness too on visiting Japan on the way home. Sato had to recognize that this was probably the last journey he would make to East Asia by any route. His favored route via the Pacific Ocean and USA was both expensive and lengthy. So it was a farewell visit to his common law wife and friends but he was able to discuss his son coming to London as he did between 1910 and 1916. He was also welcomed by his former Japanese diplomatic associates and by the Imperial family. There was no doubt that Sato needed a rest. The job of being British minister at Peking was a demanding one, partly because China had been in a critical situation throughout his tenure in Peking, partly because he had under his charge a large legation staff and uh, say 50 consuls who were members of the China Consular Service scattered around China, often in conflict situations. He had therefore to pass judgment on the merits of staff, their salaries, their leave applications, their illnesses, and a host of other issues. This had been a demanding job and required him to work arduous hours. On returning to England, Sato chose to take up long-term residence at Beaumont House, Ottery St. Mary, a town some 10 miles from Exeter, Evidently, this was for nostalgic reasons connected with pleasant memories of days spent at nearby Sidmouth, but it also suggests that he wanted to distance himself from London and the Foreign Office. Ottery being close to the slow line from Exeter to the capital, he was by no means isolated, but he was not readily accessible. Sato did not own a car. Although he was not given another post, the Foreign Office respected Sato and welcomed him back most cordially. It occasionally consulted him. It appointed him as one of Britain's representatives at the Second Hague Peace Conference in 1907. This was to take advantage of the expertise he had acquired from his degree at University College London in 1859 to 61, his studies of Roman law during his leave in Marburg, Germany in 1876, and his qualifying as a barrister at Lincoln's Inn in 1887. That is a topic fully covered by others and will not be discussed here. But on Far Eastern politics, Sato held an old fashioned view and was reluctant to express his views in public and especially to journalists. He took the line that retired diplomats had to be, unlike retired generals who spoke their mind after retirement, presumably he had certain Boer War generals in mind here. He and his colleagues had, when they retired, to be discreet about the past, present and future. He was much in demand as a lecturer, but this seems to explain why he appears to have concentrated his lectures on academic or religious issues. Thus, his Reed Lecture, that's uh, R-E-D-E, -E, capital R, uh, Reed Lecture at Cambridge in 1908, took up a largely historical subject, that of Hübner, the Austrian ambassador to Paris under Napoleon III. Characteristically, Sato turned to advantage the reading he had done on Hübner's memoirs on his lengthy journey across the Pacific Ocean two years before. 
It was perhaps at this time that he signed up to write the sections of the Cambridge Modern History, the growth of nationalities on modern China and Japan. These volumes appeared in 1909. In his conversations, Sato tried to avoid controversial topics at a time when the Far East was highly controversial. The Anglo-Japanese alliance, as renewed in 1905, was the basis of British policy. Britain decided to support the Japanese over the Sinmintung Fakumen railway affair in 1907 to the extent of ignoring the interests of her own companies and arguably of China. British mercantile opinion in China's treaty ports was very anti-Japanese at this time and had powerful support in the city of London. Important newspapers like the Times were much divided. Sato's diary suggests that he steered clear of these issues on which he may well have had strong views. Perhaps the tasks associated with the Hague Peace Conference and his remoteness from London saved him from getting involved in post-retirement bureaucratic infighting. Sato's interests were greatly influenced by his experiences at The Hague. He devoted his time for the next decade more to the field of international law than the affairs of the East. It was law very much tempered with history, and indeed Sato seems to have coined the words international history to describe his own work. According to Dr. Otte, that's Thomas Otte, he was, or T.G. Otte as he likes to be known, he was confident enough in 1910 to let his name go forward for the Cicele Professor of International Law at Oxford. He was unsuccessful, but he had no regrets. It is interesting to note that this is the very time when Oxford recruited John Gubbins, the Japanese counselor at the Tokyo legation in Sato's day, to sit, teach Japanese studies, even if only for a year. Sato has rightly been described as a distinguished scholar diplomat. As a diplomat, he was of the scholarly variety, proud of his library, and his literary and historical knowledge. He was not renowned for his work on the social side of legation activities and has been criticized for the quality of the meals he offered at the legation. After retirement, he became more scholar than diplomat, but there was the same degree of productivity and concentration as in the days of his service. He seems to have entered into the communal activities of Ottery enthusiastically. The diary contains much about his activity as a magistrate, work in schools and general countryside activities. He responded generously to the demands of religious bodies, even the China Inland Mission. But he had his preferences and favored the Anglican Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, the SPG. John Harrington Gubbins, his junior at the Tokyo Legation, visited Sato and wrote, Sir Ernest keeps very well and is very busy with local, I had almost said parochial matters of all kinds. His many-sidedness comes out in his wonderful adaptation to English modes of life and interests after so many years of foreign experience and official and scholarly activity. I can only look on and admire. Gubbins, whose career resembled that of Sato, admired him because he was more settled. Unlike Sato, Gubbins had considerable family responsibilities and moved around from place to place in retirement. Sato, on the other hand, had put down deep roots and identified himself with the community at Ottery till his death. But he still welcomed visits from old Japan hands like W.G. Aston, a fellow member of the Far East Consular Service, and Alan Shand, the banker. In the metropolis, there is no evidence of his seeking a role at the Japan Society of London, the home of many of those within with Japan service. When approached by J.C. Hall to become a president of the China Society, founded in 1906, he declined. Sato, of course, had his critics. The Kobe Chronicle, under its acerbic editor Robert Young, had commented, commented in 1900 that he was too weak to take up the post of minister at Peking. In this, he was communicating the general views of the treaty port merchants. They found Sato too aloof. The Chronicle stated that Sato believed that Orientals had rights and that wider issues had sometimes to take precedence over local ones. He was out of sympathy with the spirit of the new imperialism. Sato was alleged to have responded that he was pleased with this appreciation of his character. He was reluctant to go around the treaty ports in China and explain government policies. Um, he did not please George Ernest Morrison, Peking correspondent of the Times. From time to time, he displeased successive foreign secretaries, Lord Salisbury and Lord Lansdowne. 
But by and large, Sato was a safe pair of hands, conscientious, hardworking, and cautious. He kept on good terms with politicians of his host countries in Japan and China, and rarely caused upsets. He was proud of his linguistic skills and his long experience in the East. He was modestly proud too of his policy recommendations to successive governments and was keen to have a favorable reputation in history. He wrote, I should like my memory to be vindicated for I worked hard and have a good conscience about the policy I pursued and recommended to HMG. Perhaps for that reason, he left his papers during his lifetime to the public record office, later the National Archives Q, and allowed his private correspondence to be quoted in the series of British documents on the origins of the war, a unique distinction. These were bold decisions of a rather confident man. P.D. Coates, in his authoritative book about the China consuls, writes on page 445, Sato, his fiery youth behind him, had turned into an efficient, discreet, and impeccably groomed diplomatist. Ian Ruxton and his publisher are to be congratulated for publishing his post-retirement diaries. They show that Sato in his later years was not the austere, slightly forbidding figure he had been in Peking. He was able to adapt to a more relaxed style of life. Still hardworking and methodical in his new role as a scholar, he was also able to fit into a rural community and build new friendships. Ian Nish, May 2015. Uh, Professor Nish, Emeritus Professor of the London School of Economics. And I just uh, continue with my editorial preface and acknowledgements. This edited, annotated, and indexed transcription of the diaries of Sir Ernest Sato, PC GCMG, 1843 to 1929, covers only the first five and a half years of his long retirement, which lasted officially from the 26th of October, 1906, uh, see the FO list, 1930, until his death on the 26th of August, 1929. The last known diary entry is 31st December, 1926. To my knowledge, the diaries for the years 1906 to 1911, starting in this book from the 9th of June, 1906, when he leaves Japan for the last time and ending on the last day of 1911, have never before been published. Yet the years of transition to retirement from a full and responsible working life as a high level diplomat with its heavy responsibilities and busy social interactions would mark a major change in any career. This is not to say that Sato went suddenly from being very busy to doing very little. On the contrary, these diaries clearly reveal that he had plenty to keep him occupied. First, there was the important appointment as delegate to the Second Peace Conference at The Hague, which took up most of 1907, and the social events and business deliberations of which he recorded daily in considerable detail. There was also the matter of finding somewhere to live. Initially, Sato was in temporary accommodation. He rented Solcombe House in Sidmouth for six months from the 1st of August, 1906. He first saw Beaumont, the house in Ottery St. Mary, where he would reside on November the 18th, but he was unable to move directly from Solcombe House to Beaumont and was obliged to camp in the Royal York Hotel at Sidmouth for the month of February before signing a lease for a term of years and moving to Beaumont in early March, 1907. House hunting with a view to buying a Devon property outright began in February 1909. It lasted until April 1910, when Mrs. Troop, that's T-R-O-U-P, agreed to sell Beaumont and the sale was finally completed in June 1910. Thanks mainly to his habit of taking regular walks, usually in the local area with his dogs, but sometimes further afield with human companions, and also to a modest and moderate lifestyle, Sato seems to have had few health problems. However, he did have a slight deformity in his hands and underwent an operation on his intestine on the 21st of October, 1908, which was successful. No serious problem was discovered and Sato was much relieved, resuming his diary after a seven week lapse to write on the 7th of December, 1908. I had greatly dreaded the operation and it was a great relief to find that nothing of what the doctors apprehended had been found. Neither ulcer of the duodenum gastritis nor cancer. Bartlett says that an incision was made into the duodenum to see and then was sewn up again. I felt that I had come back from the jaws of death. There is plenty of evidence in these diaries of Sato's academic inclinations and his switch from diplomat with scholastic ability to a second career of 
scholar of international law, history and diplomacy, seems to have been made quite seamlessly and effortlessly. Sato was seriously considered for professorships of international law at both Cambridge, that was the, the Hewell, W-H-E-W-E-L-L, -L, Hewell profession, Professorship in 1909, and Oxford, the Chichele uh, Professorship in 1911, that's C-H-I-C-H-E-L-E. -E. However, he did not put himself forward for the former post, despite being urged to do so by the noted international lawyer, John Pauley Bate, since he had already recommended T.J. Lawrence and felt he, Sato, lacked, in, lacked sufficient expertise. Uh, that's in his diary for 5th of July, 1908. As to the latter post, the Oxford post, though he did apply, he expressed relief that Henry Earl Richards had been elected to the chair, writing in his diary on the 2nd of March, 1911, I am relieved that my candidature has not succeeded. To have to live six months in the year at Oxford away from my books and deliver 42 lectures would be a great trial. Notwithstanding his reluctance to take either of these prestigious posts, Sato produced many scholarly papers in retirement. He kept in contact with the editors of the Cambridge Modern History, A.W. Ward, G.W. Prothero and S. Leaves, and contributed a chapter on the Far East, China and Japan to volume 11 in 1909. He also published in the Quarterly Review, 1909 and 1911. From 1912, his output did not diminish and his major two volume classic, Guide to Diplomatic Practice was published by Longman's Green and Company in 1917. He was also awarded the honorary degrees of LLD by Cambridge in 1903 and DCL that's Doctor of Civil Laws, uh, by Oxford in 1908. So LLD is Doctor, a legum doctor, uh, but again, Doctor of Laws. They were both uh, law, honorary law doctorates. And he gave the Reed Lecture at Cambridge University in 1908, the one already mentioned by uh, Professor Ian Nish <clears throat> about Hubner. There is much about the Sato family in these diaries, which was extensive in the Grand Victorian manner, as the family tree, see Appendix 3, shows. The most frequent family visitors to Beaumont were Ernest's younger brother, Sam, and his brother-in-law, Henry Fanshawe Tozer, the Oxford academic. But younger relations were also welcome. Sato's second son, Hisayoshi Takeda, came to Beaumont several times after his arrival in Britain to study botany on the 28th of April, 1910. There were frequent visits from close friends, especially the Japan experts, John Harrington Gubbins and Frederick Victor Dickens, and from many acquaintances gathered over his long and varied diplomatic career in Japan, Siam, Uruguay, Morocco, and China. Sato maintained a close relationship with a widowed friend of long standing named Emma Sturges, and struck up strong friendships with his fellow Hague delegates, Lord Rie and Sir Edward Fry, both of whom he visited in the Scottish borders and near Bristol, respectively. Yet as Professor Nish notes, he also fitted in very well at Ottery St. Mary in Exeter and around the county of Devon and made many new friends, notably the Reverend and Mrs. Pryke, that's P-R-Y-K-E. His high profile work as a local and county magistrate and Blundell school governor, his well-reported interest in missionary work, naval and military matters, and politics all helped to widen his circle of friends and acquaintances. Meanwhile, his loyal and trusted servants, the Scottish housekeeper, Mrs. Janet Kasberg, nay Black, in her 70s, and his Japanese manservant, Homma Saburo, hired in Japan in the 1880s, looked after his household and everyday needs as a gentleman of some means. Every effort has been made to reproduce the diaries exactly as Sato wrote them, except that for improved readability, two procedures have been adopted. There were many abbreviations in the original text, which indicates that Sato wrote at speed. Most of these have been restored to full words, though a few have been expanded using square brackets. A list of the most common abbreviations used by Sato appears in the second footnote in the book and as Appendix 1. Also, and again, because Sato was writing quickly, there are sometimes long passages of text which are sometimes indigestible. In these cases, paragraph breaks have been added, which it is hoped will ease comprehension. Naturally, the editor accepts all and any blame for errors of any kind, 
including transcription and annotation in this book. I owe a great debt of gratitude to various people who have assisted with the bringing to publication of this book. Professor Ian Nish, Emeritus, London School of Economics, kindly consented to write the foreword above, and Professor Robert Morton of Chuo University, the co-author with me of the Sato Diaries for 1861 to 69, published by Eureka Press in 2013, brought his rigorous eye and invaluable advice to an early proof. I must also thank Eureka Press of Kyoto for agreeing to publish this volume. And last, of, last but of course not least, my wife for supporting me patiently through the many hours spent on this most worthwhile and fulfilling project. Uh, and a note, these diaries were transcribed from the original stored at the National Archives of the UK in London. The references are as follows, PRO 30 slash 33, 16 slash nine through 12. Ian Ruxton, Kyushu Institute of Technology, July, 2015. And um, that's really it. Um, I worked pretty hard on these diaries. There was a, a lot in them. I added a lot of footnotes um, and uh, there they are. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you again soon.